guess to sort of summarize what we talked about, um, I know there's a lot and there's a lot more to talk about. Um, so I also included some resources on the page if you want to kind of read more about data viz and um, linking as well to some of my favorite code viz that is particularly inspiring and just does a phenomenal job of communicating different aspects of the disease. Um, one of the biggest things we've seen and I kind of kept harping on um, is the audience's responses to, to a visualization. Um, there's a lot we can't control with how an audience is going to perceive um, or any given person is going to perceive a viz. Um, but it's the responsibility of the designer to make sure that the viewer has as much information as possible and as clear a means as possible um, to actually understand the graphic. Um, so much like I feel like in science, we always talk about alternative hypotheses, but alternative interpretations are a huge part of, of data viz. So you might come into a graphic thinking like, well, this is, this is the way you would interpret it, but it's your job to think like, how else can this be interpreted by someone who doesn't know anything about the data and is just looking at my, my graphic. Um, the other aspect I've touched on as well too, accessible design. So, uh, very simple things like, um, using color schemes that are accessible for people who are colorblind, um, or even just something simple as like making your font size big enough. Um, is really critical for people actually being able to understand your viz since that's a very i think easy thing to to, to do um if you're if you're making viz um much more difficult to deal with is is cognitive bias so i hinted at this a bit but um the problem with a lot of covid viz is people are coming in especially because it's become so politicized unfortunately people are coming into looking at viz with their own preconceived notions. Um, this applies to pretty much everything, but especially for COVID, um, people come in thinking like, well, I, I feel like it's not that bad. You know, if you're, if you're going to come into looking at a graph already kind of thinking like this disease can't hurt me or I'm invincible in some way, or I already got it. So I'm immune, whatever, it, whatever myth you want to throw out there. Um, that's going to be the framing with which you approach a viz. Um, so the visualization designer job is not to fight that cognitive bias, but is to present, you know, as much information. So um, there's less fodder for, for that to be kind of, uh, kind of latched, latched onto and re reappropriated. Of course, you can't control everything. Stuff's going to happen. Uh, grifters are going to grift, but you know, you have to um, keep that in mind for how people can, can take things out of context. Um, and the flip side too, right? I think we often think about that, that more kind of, um, anti-science perspective, but people can also come into things thinking, you know, this is how I've been told this is supposed to work. So that's the way it's going to be. Even if it's something like, I don't know, like for a long time where there was very kind of, uh, conflicting data about the spread of COVID in schools, it's still kind of unclear. Um, and a lot of people went in being like, well, if it spreads here, it's going to spread everywhere, or kids can spread it more easily than, than adults, and all kinds of narratives, right? Like, lots of quick distillations to get clear pictures. Of course, visualizing things like this um, is extra precarious because the data upon which you're visualizing often is conflicting. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind when choosing to, to make a visualization for a piece of data. Think about the data first. Um, and so this gets into, um, another point I wanted to touch on. Um, I'm just going to jump down to understand the data because actually this is, this is really, really important. Um, I showed many different types of data in these different graphics. Um, something as simple, ostensibly simple as COVID cases, um, can mean so many different things. So... The way in which a COVID case is defined can depend on Department of Health. It can depend on the person running the test. It can define, depend on the country. Like there's so many different uh, kind of caveats to that. And so it's the absolute responsibility at bare minimum for someone designing a visualization to really take into consideration what the data that they're actually showing is. Um, and so I'll get into this a bit more for the coding video, but um, 
when looking when getting any kind of new data, it's your job to understand like where did this data come from, who collected it, how is it collected, what's the quality of the data, how are how are metrics being defined um, or calculated, and things like that. Um, th this is really like fundamental to to making any kind of visualization, and oftentimes this is the bulk of the work. Um, if you don't understand the data, you have no business trying to visualize it, just as a as a kind of fact. Um, but oftentimes that's that's mostly work, and the actual creation of the graphic is maybe even less time. Um, but that that's a huge part of data viz. Um, and so the thing I've talked about probably the most today is providing context. So it's really um, probably the biggest problem that visualizations struggle with in that they're often missing or partially represented um, to inject bias potentially. Um, or if it's inadvertent, the bias is injected for them, right? Um, and so using annotations, like I showed you some of the Financial Times graphics, is really cool and very, very helpful for framing stuff for people, right? Like little arrows and lines to be like, this is what this trend is and this is what this label is. I know it's not very common, unfortunately, in a lot of science viz, but it's really good for general data viz, especially for something as complicated um, as COVID-19. Explaining labels in terms, so saying something like case fatality rate without saying what that even means is really problematic, right? You have to say like, this was calculated using this metric and using these definitions. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a very easy thing to do, but a lot of people don't do it. Um, showing trends over time is generally a good thing to do. Uh, so I mentioned how the Reuters graphic was showing those weekly aggregations. A lot of other um, publications will do seven day averages, which is something I will use as well in the coding video. Um, as a way to remove the noise from uh, individual uh, days being potentially off or randomly high or low. And you can misinterpret maybe a data dump of cases as being like an actual spike in cases, for example, um, when maybe the reality is uh, the person in inputting the data took the weekend off and waited to input a, like a backlog of data from two days on uh, the following day. So that, that's something that happens a lot, unfortunately, uh, especially in many, many different health departments in the country. Um, but a one-day number also, um, just showing someone like, today this number of cases happened, is also kind of problematic because um, it doesn't really mean much, right? When you talk about a single day, when you're not comparing it with the day before or the day after. Um, it won't help viewers understand the bigger picture, and again, reporting data issues can affect single day uh, numbers. Another really important thing is to keep your metrics consistent. This sounds really basic, but um, you know, I showed you that kind of like messed up y-axis before, but mixing different types of testing, for example, is a common thing people do. Um, that can be really misleading. Uh, some data viz have these manipulated axes to create, you know, maybe more extreme graphs. Um, others have compared viruses to things like the plague or influenza, um, but then do that over maybe like disproportionate time lengths. Um, so like comparing six months of COVID data to a year of influenza doesn't sound like a huge difference, but it, it actually is. That's, that's double the time with which, you know, the disease can spread and, you know, go around a population. Um, so yeah, keeping keeping comparisons as comparable as possible. And that gets into, as well, the sort of normalization thing um, for population as well, too. So keeping population as limited as a compound as possible. Uh, population is important, but it's important in the sense in that it can help calculate like per capita uh, type changes. So when you're comparing states, cities, regions in general, um, the number of people matter. Uh, more than that, actually, the, the, the people themselves matter. So demographics change as well, too. So um, it's rare to see this, but it's actually good practice to probably correct for things like um, age and racial diversity to see. You can actually, if you, if you look for those things and normalize across population that way, um, you can start to pick out 
differences in uh, maybe like severity of the disease hitting different populations, which is something that actually did come out when uh, the spread of COVID was more carefully studied across uh, different race race groups in America. Um, and the most important thing I think that is not so often done, uh, I think the New York Times piece did that really well, was to acknowledge the uncertainty and limitations of the data. Um, so, right, I think understanding what we don't know, understanding what isn't shown, is something that is inherently very, very hard to do, and kind of gets back to my initial point earlier of uh, kind of communicating uncertainty is the most difficult thing to do, especially because people are expecting um, clear-cut, simple, um, straightforward answers. But this is this is the kind of responsibility of the vi visualization designer. So something like adding a note section at the end of a viz, um, including some additional text to kind of clarify some points or saying like, oh, on these two days, data is missing. And so to handle that, we like remove these days from the calculation. Easy, easy thing to do. Um, but the kind of scope of those limitations and the scope of the uncertainty kind of as they grow, it makes it harder to actually make a, a viz that's compelling. So that's also something you weigh when you even decide to, to make your viz in the first place. Making COVID viz um, in this day and age is, it's something that's really important still. Um, we're still very much in the midst of this pandemic. Um, I thought the study was like pretty cool. They took um, a little over 5,000 COVID visualizations from April to May of this past year, um, specifically from Twitter, and they were about COVID-19, um, and try to look at potential, you know, challenges with how things were, were framed. And a lot of this is stuff I just mentioned, right? Cognitive bias, not really getting the virus. Um, yeah, these are, these are problems that um, I think all data viz has to deal with. Um, and I think the fact that mistrust was so high here just kind of, uh, highlights just how, how, how kind of messy the field, uh, the messy the audience is in terms of putting in new COVID viz. So many people are distrustful of data sources. And so being as transparent and as explicit about where the data is coming from is really, really key to kind of conveying something with, with your viz if you're going to put something out there in the public. Um, the information that is in any given viz, sometimes like it's intentionally obscured and that breeds, you know, that kind of mistrust. Um, and so, right, the, these are just some of the, the top things the researchers found as being like the biggest challenges with, uh, with viz um, on Twitter which is unfortunately a place where a lot of people share, share uh, COVID viz. So um, some of it's great and some of it is very much not. So uh, it's oftentimes hard to um, parse those differences. Um, and on an awesome note, there is so much like phenomenal COVID viz out there, uh, like truly inspiring. This is just a small sample of it. Um, and the links will be on the page too. But um, yeah, I, some of this I already showed from the New York Times and the Washington Post, the Financial Times. But they all, their teams have made incredible, incredible, incredible other stories, um, visualizations, interactives. Um, I wanted to also highlight a couple other ones from the Reuters graphics team. They did this really compelling piece on. Uh, one woman in Korea who seeded their biggest COVID-19 cluster. Um, this is in South Korea, and the kind of storytelling flow of that piece is really remarkable. Even more kind of innovative, um, Shirley Wu did this, uh, I actually worked with a team of people to create um, a literal game to kind of simulate different conditions around um, public health measures and, and situations around uh, again, sort of like a fake disease, but 
in a pandemic situation, people the pandemic game. So there's like a lot of really, really fun biz out there. Um, and so don't feel like, you know, you need to like replicate anyone else's work or anything, but it's really inspiring. And so if you wanted to take time to learn about how to do COVID biz, um, I think looking at their work is a really inspiring place to start. Um, and yeah, it's completely okay to, to make viz on your own time um, and build kind of skill sets um, and get feedback from others um, until you're ready to make your own visualizations in general. It doesn't have to be about COVID-19 because hopefully um, COVID-19 visualizations won't, won't be as prominent of a thing in the next uh, year or so.